So here's what we want to do, my friends. We want to um, we want to prove that this limit is equal to this using the precise definition of a limit. And the way that we're going to do this is this is a two-step process. Okay. So the first step is we want to find the delta. So we're going to say let epsilon greater than zero be given. So they're going to give me some epsilon. And then what I need to do is I need to find delta. And our delta is going to depend on epsilon. I should tell you that the epsilon, case I keep using it, but uh, I don't know if I ever wrote it down. So this is our strategy, my friends. We're going to start off with the um, with the closeness of the y part first. So we're going to start off with this absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Then we're going to do a whole bunch of algebra. And at the end, our hope is that we're going to end up with an x minus a is less than delta. And then whatever this expression is right here, that's what I'm going to choose my delta to be. So if I can always win this game, then the limit exists. If there's an epsilon where I can't win the game, then the limit doesn't exist. Okay. So let's take a look and see how this works. So in case it's not totally obvious, our f of x is going to be equal to 3x plus 1, and our l is equal to 4. I hope there's no questions about that. OK. So we're going to substitute in. Oops. We're going to substitute in. So our f of x is going to be 3x plus 1 minus 4 is less than epsilon. Okay. Now we're going to simplify that inside part. So when we simplify that inside part, that tells you that uh, 3x minus 3 is less than epsilon. Does anyone have any suggestions for what I should do next? Not really. Uh, can you factor out the three? I can. I think that's a great idea. Um, did you mean factor it out like this? Or did you mean factor it all the way out of the uh, absolute value? Um, I meant like that. OK. Then maybe in the next step, we'll factor it out of the absolute value. And then what do you want to do next? You're, you're doing great. So maybe you or someone else can say, suggest something. I just have a question. Yes. So if it's positive, you can factor it out of the absolute value? If it was negative, I could still split it up. Um, if you have something like absolute value of A times B, that's equal to absolute value of A times absolute value of B. So if I had like negative three times x minus one, that would factor as absolute value of negative three, absolute value of x minus one, and then that would be three x minus one. Does that make sense? Like you're taking absolute value of each piece. Uh -huh. That makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any suggestions as to what the basic final step is gonna be here for this first part, finding delta? Well, what I could do is I could divide both sides by three. So I'll have x minus one is less than epsilon over three. 
And this is really matching my x minus a is less than delta, right? Because my a was equal to uh, one. I forgot to write that up top there. My a is equal to one. So it's almost like you have a one here. You have a one here, that's your a, and then this is your delta. So this is our a, and this is our delta. So all of this was just to find out what our delta should be. So let's go back and look at our definition. Our definition says, for every delta greater than zero, we can find, I'm sorry, for every epsilon greater than zero, we can find a delta so that when my x values are within the delta band, the y values will be within the epsilon band. So what did I do? I said, okay, bring it on. Give me epsilon. So now I have epsilon in my hands. Now I'm going to provide the delta for you. And then I'm going to show that this conditional is automatically satisfied. Okay, So we're going to prove this by actually telling people what the delta should be. All right, so let's look at the second part. Okay, the second part says, um, this is the proof part. I'll just call it the proof, okay? So we let, epsilon greater than zero be given. We choose delta to be equal to epsilon divided by three. I want to show that x minus one less than delta implies that f of x minus l is less than epsilon. If I could show that this is always true, then the limit exists. So we start off with the x minus one less than, I said the delta is gonna be epsilon over three. What does this mean? That's the same thing as three times x minus one is less than epsilon. That's the same thing as saying, absolute value of three X minus three is less than epsilon. That's the same thing as saying absolute value of three X plus one minus four is less than epsilon. And that's like saying, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So I've just shown that when they give me the epsilon, I can always find the delta so that this, so I win the game, so that uh, the definition is satisfied. Does that make sense? We've literally followed along the definition. So I'm gonna step through with you one more time. In our definition, it says, for every epsilon greater than zero. So they give me the epsilon. There exists a delta. I provide the delta such that whenever I'm within distance delta of A, that's the, uh, the X values are within the delta band. The Y values will be within the epsilon band. We stay within, the, the Y values stay within a distance epsilon of L. So when I look at my proof, they gave me the delta. I chose, I'm sorry, they gave me the epsilon. I chose the delta. And then I wanted to show the implication right here. I wanted to show this purple implication right here. So I start off with the x minus a is less than delta. I made a substitution for delta. I essentially ran this work in reverse 
And then we were able to prove that we end up with, that we stay in the epsilon band. Okay. Is there any questions about this so far? Yeah, I got a question. For the okay. 3x minus 3 absolute value, how do you turn that into 3x plus 1 minus 4 absolute value? Well, 1 minus 4 is negative 3, right? Yeah. You see, my whole goal is to write it as f of x minus l. So I just take this guy and I split it into two pieces. So if you look, I'm basically running this argument in reverse, right? I was here and then I, I'm just going backwards. So it's kind of like on this side part over here, I started off with the y part and I had to break it down to get what my delta was. And then for the proof part, I just run the whole argument in reverse. So it's basically a as above, so below thing. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Um, it's almost like all the work is done in finding the delta, but the actual proof of the definition, you have to kind of uh, run it in reverse to actually prove it. So a student privately asks me, what can I do with this kind of stuff? It looks weird to me. <laughs> and um, I guess this is like, I guess high level math stuff. So it's not really practically that useful. It's sort of uh, conceptually interesting. And as you move higher and higher in mathematics, things become a little bit more and more abstract. And it becomes more and more necessary to define your definitions precisely. So, um, so this is sort of an introduction to that. 